Hello! So, there is this great debate in the beekeeping community that all of us have heard or taken part in, and that is, don't say it too loudly, otherwise people might get upset. And that is treatment free. <gasps> I didn't just say that. All jokes aside, okay, we all know that for some people it can really ruffle your feathers talking about treatment free, but I've seen so many people and I've had so many people ask, hey Em, I really am thinking about going treatment free, but there are there's no information out there on how to do it. And it really seems that whenever you ask another beekeeper it, um, they just look at you like you're crazy. So today I'm gonna tell you guys exactly how to go treatment free successfully. Okay, so the big disclaimer that I first want to say when it comes to being treatment free. Oh, one of these bees is not happy that I'm over here talking and it's going to have to deal with it. <laughs> and that disclaimer is when it comes to being treatment free or in all honesty, all of beekeeping, everything is trial and error and um, everything is just based off of how you beekeep in your own environment. There's so many different ways to do things. So everything I explained today is just something I'm gonna explain of my own experience and what I've seen in my own yard and what has actually been successful. So let's get to it. So first I'm gonna define my definition of treatment free because there's a little bit of a gray area and some people say that even just requeening a hive can be considered a treatment, but the way I'm gonna consider treatment free is that you are not using any chemicals in your hive. Now, you're still gonna have to manage your bees in certain ways so that you can help cut those mite down, mites down. Now, some people would call that a treatment, but the reason I'm not calling that, at least in my definition, is because, okay, Say you were to have a hive and you were to just leave it alone and have absolutely no intervention from a beekeeper. During one year season, that hive is going to requeen at least two to three times. They're gonna send out at least a couple swarms and then they might even try to requeen sometime after the summer solstice. So keeping that in mind, now compared to the way that we beekeep, we try to keep our bees from ever swarming, so we don't even give them an opportunity to requeen. And on top of that, we try to make queens live as long as they possibly can. We try to make queens live to like three or four years. And for a beehive, this might not necessarily be the most beneficial thing unless you're moving her around a lot. Not saying that having an old queen is bad, just saying you will have to move her around if you want to keep her, um, keep a treatment free kind of mindset and whatnot. So, why do we even treat to begin with? Um, so, as you guys know, we have a really big problem with Varroa mites, but also, like I just mentioned, the way that we beekeep, we make it so that our hives always have a queen and that we never let them requeen on their own, unless we just completely take out their queen and give them back a mated queen. So they never get that brood break. They never get a time where they don't have a queen that's laying. And that's just gonna be a breeding ground for mites because mites reproduce in the cells of the bees, of the developing brood, because they feed on the larva. And this is also where they reproduce. This is where they lay eggs and that's where their baby mites all feed on the larva as well. And then when that cell becomes um, grown and the bee comes out and emerges, so do all of those mites come with it. So when you're never letting your hive have a natural brood break, you're going to have to treat because you're not creating that that pause, that, that disruption in the mites breeding cycle. And that's really important. Now, I have heard some people say, okay, um, a brood break is great and all, and it might work, but then you're not gonna be making any honey. And my response to this is, timing is absolutely everything. As you know, as a beekeeper, timing is so important because everything is timed off of the pollen, the nectar flows, the time of year, the changing seasons, all of that. So you have to time your brood break directly with the bees and how they fluctuate with the seasons. So right now it's about to be July in just a couple days and now is the perfect time to be doing a brood break. That's why I'm doing this video. And the reason for this is, is it's now post summer solstice, which is a really, really hot time 
for the bees because as soon as it switches over from days getting longer to days getting shorter, now the bees know winter is coming and they start preparing. They start a stress response in the hive and they're like, okay, we need to have honey, we need to have pollen, we need to have enough bees. They start thinking about all the plans they need to do and start acting on those so that they're ready when it comes. Now, when you do a brood break right after the summer solstice, first things first, you're going to have a queen that was born and mated after the summer solstice. And what happens when this happens is that queen is going to be a monster because she is born into an environment where the bees are already under a little bit of stress. And that stress is going to cause her to lay really, really heavy because she's now being born into a time where the days are getting shorter and the winter is coming and she's brand new. And she's like, oh my gosh, what if this hive dies? What if it's all my fault? Everything relies on her to make sure she shows up and she lays for these bees because they don't have much time. So they're gonna make her lay really heavy and build up really, really fast. And I've seen this time after time and it's actually crazy, crazy cool because it makes it so you're able to kind of like play off of the bees and how they work so that you not only get a really big build up in the springtime, but you also get a really big build up in the fall time just in time to hit the fall flow. Now, the bees have a natural brood break in the winter time when it's cold because naturally they completely stop the queen from laying and they go into like a sort of hibernation mode when they go into the cluster and just huddle together. And they wait until it hits the winter solstice, I believe is the day that they start laying again and start preparing for spring. Don't quote me on that. I should probably look up the exact time when they usually flip a switch over. Um, but on a certain day, they start laying eggs again, and that's when they start building up. But they do go through a one or two month, depending on your location, brood break. That's going to help them cut the mites mite back in the winter time to help prepare for spring. But in order to prepare for winter, when your hive numbers start going down, that is why it's important for you to do your brood break now. And I'm probably going to have a lot of haters for saying this, but I try to be completely transparent on this channel and be completely honest with what I see in the beekeeping realm. And so there's bee havers and there's beekeepers. And what I'm starting to see is that it seems to be that hobbyists are taking on the same technique and styles of beekeeping that commercial beekeepers use. And that's not necessarily something that should go together because they both have different goals. So if you have a goal for making sure your bees make it through the winter, you need to adapt your own method to take care of your bees. Because the way that, I don't want to say this in a bad way because I'm like, this isn't a bad thing. This is just a way that they decide to do it and a way they decide to do business. And a lot of like the bigger beekeepers, commercial beekeepers, they don't have to have all their hives survive through the winter. Now, maybe some of them, they would prefer that, but other ones, they don't, they don't, it doesn't really make that big of a difference for them if their hives all, all die because they could just buy a package, throw them in some hives and they will just explode. Um, so that's why I say there's a difference between bee havers and beekeepers and the techniques and methods that we both use. Okay, drum roll, please. Now for the juicy details, and that is how exactly you're going to do a brood break. Okay, so the key factor that you want to keep in mind is that it takes exactly 16 days from egg to the fully developed bee from to emerge from the cell and the reason that this is important is because when doing a brood break your goal is to go until you have absolutely no brood whatsoever left in that hive so what you're going to do in order to perform a brood break i have like my notes of thoughts here um so that i could kind of keep organized for you guys and i don't just jump all over the place because i know sometimes i do that but anyways, I'm jumping all over the place again. Here I go, but <laughs> don't mind me. Okay, so how you're gonna do a brood break is you're going to take the queen out of your hive and you're going to put her in say a nuke box like this one over here. And the reason why I say put her in a nuke box and don't put her in a giant deep is because bees perform better in a small space and she will build up very quickly when she's in this smaller box. Versus in a big box that just has way too much space for them, then they have more space to manage, more space to like temperature control and whatnot. So put your queen and a frame or two of brood and resources in this nuke box. 
And then you're just going to leave her, let her build up, give her some empty frames, give her some empty comb or foundation to draw out. And she will build up that hive and be happy as can be. <laughs> I was trying to do a pun there, but it didn't really work out. Um, okay, so now this hive is not going to have a queen in it whatsoever. And what's going to happen is that hive is then going to start making queen cells. And there's going to be two ways, well, actually three ways you can go about this. The first way you can go about this is at one week or once you see that all of the queen cells are capped or they're starting to develop take out every single queen cell that you see and the reason why i say one week is because you don't want there to be any eggs in this colony meaning they do not have any other option to make a queen so you're going to go in kill every single queen cell and then you can either one introduce a virgin queen which will then take around 10 to 14 days to go out on a mating flight and come back and start laying again and during that time the rest of the brood is going to emerge and she's going to start laying after the brood has all emerged they're going to have absolutely no brood left in this colony now the second way that you can do this if you don't want to worry about putting a virgin queen in a hive and then waiting for her to come back and then hoping that she comes back okay and she doesn't get lost or eaten by a bird or anything then you could also put in a mated queen at two weeks so the reason I say two weeks is because, remember, 16 days is how long it takes from egg to emergence of a bee. So at 14 days, you would put in a mated queen. She's not going to start laying right away because of the stress and the transportation, and she also is going to have to gain some weight before she can start laying some eggs again. Even if she was just taken from a hive and moved within 24 hours, she's still going to lose some weight, and she's going to have to regain that to start laying properly. And on top of that, she has to memorize her hive and learn everything about it and whatnot. So at 14 days, make sure all of the queen cells were gone um, the week prior. Do another check just to make sure you didn't miss anything, um, that there's not a virgin queen running around or anything like that. And put a mated queen into the hive and then... At that time, what's going to end up happening is the reason this brood break works is when she starts laying again. So hold on, let me back up a little bit. So when all of those mites were in the cells, they were underneath the cappings of that brood. And that's the reason why you need to wait, because once that brood emerges, all of the mites will then come out with it. And that's exactly what you want, because those mites will have nowhere to go except for on the bees. Now you're thinking, oh, okay, but now they're making the bees weak. But that's why we're doing this in July, because we're not making winter bees until August. But, okay, I'm getting off track again. <laughs> so what's going to happen is you have all these mites on the bees. Once that new queen starts laying, yes, you're going to end up sacrificing your first round of brood. But all of those mites, their main driver is to reproduce. So they're going to then flood all of the cells, all of the cells that have larvae in it once they re reach the correct age. And they're going to flood them and start feeding on the larvae. Once that larva grows a little bit, that cell will then begin, will become capped. But what happened in during that time is that because there was only so much larva, but there was all of these mites that had came out of the brood and were on the bees, there's going to be more mites per cell than there normally would be, which means there's not going to be that much food to go around. So... What's going to end up happening is those mites are literally going to starve to death because they're going to be trapped underneath the wax capping in the cell. They're going to start feeding on that larva. They're going to start reproducing, making more uh, baby mites, but then they're going to run out of food because they're going to completely demolish that larva. And at that point, because they can't get back out, they're going to end up starving to death. So you literally completely eliminate all of the mites in your hive. So yes, you're going to end up sacrificing your first round of brood, but then after that, all of your brood is going to be able to produce and grow healthily. Healthily? I don't even think healthily is a word. But they're going to be able to grow and be really strong without any interference from mites feeding on them. And like I kind of briefly mentioned on a little tangent earlier, the reason this is important to do this now is because once it hits August, your bees are going to start making winter bees. And you want those winter bees to be as strong as possible because there's something in their in their fat bodies called the telogenin that is absolutely crucial for them to be able to make it through the winter time. I've talked about it in a couple other videos, um, so go watch those if you want a little bit more of an explanation. Um, if there's enough interest, maybe I'll actually do a video on the telogenin explaining everything about it because it is absolutely fascinating. But... 
mites feed on that vitelligenin. So if the bees don't have enough vitelligenin, then they're not going to be able to make it through the winter because it's one, their energy stores, but also two, it's what they rely on to produce brood food when there's not that much pollen or protein left in the hive once it starts hitting um, late winter time, early spring time. So it's absolutely crucial if you want your hives to survive to have those high levels of vitelligenin. So that's why you want those mite levels to be down. So every time I've done this, I've seen a high winter survivability, but also one thing that is going to make a huge difference is like I said, when you have a hive that um, has a queen that is born and mated post-summer solstice, she is going to lay, 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 lay like freaking crazy. So they're not only going to have that brood break, but they're going to build up really, really fast. So you're going to have a higher number of bees going into winter time, which will then make you have a larger cluster to be able to keep everything warm and on top of that you're going to have more bees to be able to take care of the brood once it starts hitting early spring and they start queen rear or making that brood again um to prepare for the springtime and the spring build up in the spring flow plus with that new post-summer solstice queen the bees are going to build up just in time to really hit that fall flow so that they have just enough food that they need to make it through the winter time Okay, so the main thing that you really need to take away from this video for how to perform a brood break is that two-week window. You need to wait two weeks for all of that brood to emerge, and then you only have to be broodless for necessarily one or two days because that queen is going to start laying, and that's also going to give a little bit of a buffer time before the uh, eggs are, are developed enough and turned into larvae for the mites to then go into those cells. Plus, on top of that, they're going to have all of those empty cells and all of those mites are going to want to reproduce. So they're just going to end up flooding those cells. So the key is that two weeks that you want to wait. Now, I forgot to mention the third way of doing this is if you are somebody who grafts your own queen queens or you have access to queen cells, then you can rem remove the queen and put a queen cell in her place instead. But first, hold on, once you wait for the, them to make their own queen cells and remove every single queen cell that you see, make sure you don't miss one because they're really easy to, to miss. They hide them really, really well. But once you're for sure they don't have any queen cells and they are completely, hopelessly queenless, that is the key. They have to be hopelessly queenless. Then you add your queen cell, you wait for it to hatch or emerge, and then you wait for her to go out and mate. And during that time, you get your brood break, she comes back, she starts laying, and yada, 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 you get the point. And one key other factor I will just mention real fast, um, something that I've noticed in my own experiences, and that is genetics of bees really, really do matter. I've had bees that literally if they had one mite, then they would just explode with mites the entire hive. Um, because they weren't uncapping cells and they weren't managing varroa whatsoever by themselves. But then I've also had bees, which are literally all the bees that we have here because all of these mite levels are like super, super crazy low. But, um, and that is to have bees that actually uncap and manage varroa on their own. That is something that is crucial to have genetics that do that. So also keep that in mind, genetics paired with this brood break is a magical duo. Sometimes I feel like I'm all over the place when I explain things, so I hope that was helpful. I hope you understood. I hope that I taught this the best I possibly could. Well, I did teach it the best I possibly could, but I hope that you understood it the way that I was teaching it. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and ask. I'd love to help. Um, this is the way that Casey and I are performing all of our mite treatments, I guess you could call them, this year. Um, so yeah, I hope that was helpful, and I guess I'll see you guys in the next one.